Support for A Commonwealth in Crisis, The Virginia Secession Debates, is provided by The Future of Richmond's Past, The Richard S. Reynolds Foundation, Clifton and Emily Woodrum, and by the members of the Library of Virginia Foundation. Good afternoon. My name is Dan Stackhouse and I'm with the Library of Virginia. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today to our program, A Commonwealth in Crisis, Virginia's Secession Debates. I'm standing here in the old house chamber of the Virginia State Capitol, where on this day, 150 years ago, April 17, 1861, Virginia's convention came together to determine the fate of our Commonwealth, to determine whether or not Virginia should sever their ties to the United States and join the Confederacy. The spring of 1861 was a turbulent time for all of the United States. Since the election of Abraham Lincoln, seven states had determined to, to secede from the Union. And it was in February that, this, that a group came together to debate and to determine whether Virginia should follow that course. Just a few days prior, on April 12, 1861, the first shots were fired on Fort Sumter, and Abraham Lincoln has called for an army of 75,000 troops to rally to put down the rebellion. It is with all this in mind that this convention voted for a second time on April 17, 1861, to determine the fate of our Commonwealth. Here today to put some of, these, some of these events in perspective, it is my pleasure to welcome today William Freeling. He is a senior fellow at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and the editor of Showdown in Virginia, a book on the secession debates. Dr. Freeling. Ladies and gentlemen and, and my television audience, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I've spent all my adult life studying these events. Uh, and the, no the notion of standing where uh, the people stood who did all this uh, and speaking to an audience about it, uh, about one of the great events in American history, uh, is a tremendous thrill, the biggest thrill of my life. Uh, and I hope I can begin to do it uh, justice. I say this was one of the greatest days in American history, and the reason I say that is precisely because the myth about the coming of the Civil War is half true. It's half, the myth is uh, that uh, Lincoln was elected and the South en masse seceded because of black slavery. That, in a, on a thumbnail, is what most people believe about the coming of the Civil War. They believe that there was a South they believed that that South uh, believed that uh, Lincoln menaced slavery, uh, and they believed that the South, as a result, en masse seceded. No way. On the contrary, uh, one third of the South decided that Lincoln was a menace to slavery. That third of the South uh, was just the lower South, the most southern southern states, the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Louisiana uh, uh, and Texas. And those states where uh, there were huge so-called black belts and huge plantations and much growing of sugar, cotton, and rice did, although with a great deal of uh, difficulty, decide that Lincoln was a menace to slavery. To that extent, the myth that uh, the Civil War was caused by Lincoln's being elected and the Southerners thinking that Lincoln was a menace to slavery, to that extent, the myth is right. But the minute you look at the rest of the South, uh, you realize how far it is from true that automatically the so-called South seceded from the Union. Two-thirds of the South decided not to secede after Lincoln was elected. And that two-thirds of the South included the Middle South, of which uh, Virginia is the prime example, uh, and North Carolina uh, and Arkansas and Tennessee are also involved, and the upper and the border south, 
uh, the, the south of Kentucky and Maryland uh, and uh, Delaware and Missouri. Those eight states with two-thirds of the southern whites, with two-thirds of the southern slaves, decided that Lincoln was not a menace to slavery. Uh, and when you look at the rhetoric, when you look at the arguments of the Unionists, you can understand why one can make a very good case, one could make a very good case, that uh, the South should not secede in the face of Lincoln's election. Here's how that argument went. The, uh, Lincoln has captured just the presidency. He has not captured the House of Representatives. He has not captured the Senate. He has not captured the Supreme Court. Just what could he do about slavery if he wanted to? And does he want to abolish slavery? Prime piece of evidence, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. You all think of the 13th Amendment to the Constitution as the amendment passed in 1865, which abolished slavery. But that's the second form of the 13th Amendment. The first form was uh, proposed uh, in the secession uh, crisis. And although this isn't widely known, Lincoln was the one who first proposed this 13th Amendment. This 13th Amendment was passed by Congress uh, and sent to the states uh, in, the, in the wee hours before Lincoln was inaugurated on March 1861. This 13th Amendment declared that Congress shall never, Congress shall never abolish slavery. Uh, and this uh, constitutional amendment was declared unamendable, and Lincoln endorsed it, explicitly endorsed it uh, in his inaugural address. So why in the world is Lincoln a menace to slavery? He doesn't have power in Congress. He doesn't have power in the Supreme Court. He wants a constitutional amendment forever keeping congressional hands off. In view of the dubiousness that Lincoln is a threat to slavery, why not just wait? It always amuses me every time I read uh, Southern newspapers on this, because wait is always capitalized. W-A-I-T. That surely is the crucial thing to do. If Lincoln decides to abolish slavery, if Lincoln ever proves a threat, then we can secede. But why secede now? Why secede when it's so very dubious that Lincoln uh, will abolish slavery? And in particular, why secede when the fastest way you can imagine that slavery could be abolished is if we secede and lose a civil war? How could you possibly abolish slavery faster than that? What folly, then, to uh, break up the Union at this, uh, this moment? And this Unionist argument was rife throughout the whole uh, of the, uh, the so-called Upper South, which I repeat means it was rife in two-thirds of the South. It's in the atmosphere of, uh, of, of, of that uncertainty that the uh, Virginians hold their own election for uh, secession delegates on February 4th. And they make two unionist decisions, two crucial unionist decisions, do the voters uh, on February 4th, 1861. First of all, they elect a huge majority of unionist delegates to the convention that sat in this uh, room. Something like five-sixths of the delegates elected to this convention first were unionists. Very, very fond of the argument that I have uh, just uh, given. <clears throat> and the uh, electorate makes a second decision, which is often forgotten, but which is absolutely crucial. And that second decision is that the convention that we are electing cannot secede. That secession, if the convention adopts it, must be sent to the voters who must uh, ratify that decision in a popular referendum. Uh, this was a much contested idea. The secessionists wanted no part of it. They campaigned hard to have the convention make the only decision. 
but the unionists won here too. They won the right to have a popular referendum after the convention met, which gives them a second chance if they lose in the convention. Then they can win in the, in the uh, popular uh, referendum. That uh, convention uh, meets in this room on uh, February uh, 13th. Uh, and my, uh, my, my, my good friend, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tarter, has correctly called this the Unionist Convention. This is not the secessionist convention until the very end. This is the unionist convention dominated by unionists who are convinced that Virginia should, should uh, not uh, secede. And they go through all the arguments that I have uh, just gone through and they make this argument above all else. Our job as Virginians, as the people who made this nation, is now to remake this nation. Our job is to find a compromise which will uh, settle this issue. Our job is to find terms that will bring the, the, the secessionists back in the Union. Our job is to remake the Union that the Virginia dynasty made uh, in, in the uh, first place. The secessionist answer to this argument is not what you might think it is. It is not that that it is the best thing to do to secede after Lincoln's election. Their argument is, we no longer got a choice. Maybe it would have been all right uh, to, uh, to, uh, to stay in the Union right uh, after Lincoln's election, but it's not all right now. Now, the heart of the slave states is out of the Union. Now, if we stay in the Union, we would be eight slave states against 18 northern states. Now, if we stay in the Union, we may be in real uh, trouble. So the only question the secessionists kept arguing again and again is simply this. Is it plausible that we can get the other states back into the Union? And the secessionist answer is no way. Those states aren't coming back. South Carolina is not coming back. Georgia is not coming back. Alabama is not coming back. The unionists are dreaming. Uh, and instead of dreaming, let's face reality. And reality is there is going to be two nations. Uh, and the only thing we need to decide is, are we basically a slaveholding nation or are we basically a free labor nation? Uh, and so the argument gets to be only one thing. Can the Union be re-knit? Can a way be found to, uh, to uh, bring the Aryan brothers back? Can we find a way to solve all this peacefully? The unions keep saying, you bet, you bet, you bet. We got this idea, we got this idea, we got this idea. We'll call a border convention, uh, and all the states still in the union uh, will, uh, will uh, come to it, uh, and we'll, we'll arrange a remedy that is best for uh, the union. Or we'll propose constitutional amendments, which will uh, bring the uh, Aaron brothers back. Or we'll just wait, 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 uh, and hope that this fever that has captured the secession of states will uh, relent. But uh, let's try to figure out a way. So they spend two months, two long months, 3,000 pages of text uh, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the wonderful proceedings of the Virginia Secession uh, Convention that a, a man named George Reese, who worked at the Library of Virginia, uh, devised. Uh, and uh, they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and the secessionists got more and more and more uh, frustrated. Uh, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked longer than all the other Southern conventions put together uh, in 1861. Uh, 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 and finally, the exasperated secessionists on uh, April 4th, 1861, said, for God's sakes, let's vote. Let's vote on whether we're going to break up the Union. So the Unionists said, okay, let's vote. So they voted, and the Unionists won two to one. The Unionists refused to let 
Virginia uh, secede by a margin of two to one, and this is eight days before the, uh, the uh, Civil War uh, began. What finally stopped this from being a unionist convention, what finally did make this a secession convention, was what happened outside Virginia. And what happened outside Virginia was essentially to destroy the unionist argument. The unionist argument was if we wait, 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 there'll be no war, there'll be no uh, permanent southern uh, confederacy. But on April 12th and 13th, the gunfire started uh, at Fort Sumter in uh, Charleston Harbor. And after that, it was extremely difficult to argue that you should just wait. And yet, that's exactly what the Virginia Convention did. Another myth about all this uh, is that uh, Fort Sumter was fired on, and therefore Virginia seceded. No way. In fact, the delegates to the Unionist Convention kept saying, we don't need to secede yet. We don't need to give up yet. This might be a little skirmish down in Charleston. Uh, this might be over uh, soon. Uh, let's wait and make sure that the, uh, that the war is actually going to, uh, going to uh, take place. Then came what I believe is the absolutely crucial event of the whole uh, episode, which is Lincoln's proclamation on April 15, 1861. That proclamation called up 75,000 men to put down the rebellion. And that, uh, and, and among the 75,000 men that Abraham Lincoln called to uh, put down the rebellion, he asked for 2,340 Virginians. 2,340 Virginians were called up to go down to South Carolina and slaughter South, South Carolinians. 2,340 Virginians were called up to, uh, to win, um, to, to, to trample the uh, other, their fellow Southerners in the dust uh, and to uh, end this uh, rebellion. That, uh, that way of putting it, and I think Lincoln made a profound mistake by putting it that way. I'm writing a book on Abraham Lincoln right now. Uh, and this uh, his chapter of Lincoln's life is, I think, not his most uh, glorious. <clears throat> right after, right after, just as, as an aside, right after he made this decision and issued this proclamation, somebody came up to Lincoln and said, two, two Virginians came up to Lincoln and said, why didn't you just call up troops to protect Washington? Why didn't you just call up troops to protect the uh, national capital from a Confederacy invasion? Why in the world did you call up Southern troops to go down and kill South Carolinians? And Lincoln said, oh, sure, that's what, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Well, if he had said that, uh, it might have changed things a lot uh, in uh, Virginia. But what he said was he wanted Southerners to go down and murder Southerners. What he said was that his armies were going to enter the South. What he said was that the federal government was going to coerce uh, Southerners who uh, wished, to, uh, wished uh, to secede. And that changed everything because it made the issue no longer just whether black slavery was in danger from Lincoln's army. It also made the issue of whether whites were free in this, uh, at this moment. It also made the issue of whether whites should allow their territory to be invaded. It also made the issue uh, whether uh, whites should protect their firesides and their farms against an invading federal army. And that was an entirely different issue. Uh, and once that became the issue, the secessionists were in a position to, uh, to, to, to win when they hadn't been, when the question was just whether black slavery should be abolished. Let me repeat that point because I think it's so crucial. When the issue was just whether black slavery should be abolished, uh, Lincoln, when the other issue was just whether Lincoln was a menace to black slavery, one third of the Southerners wanted to secede. 
When the issue became, who do you want to fight for? Who do you want to kill? Will we, will we allow Lincoln's armies uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Virginia? Then the, uh, the tide uh, decisively uh, turned. And then things were getting pretty hot in Richmond. Uh, <clears throat> by uh, April 16th, the Richmond Convention realized that it was indeed true that uh, Lincoln had issued this proclamation. It was indeed true that war was going to start. It was indeed true that Virginians were going to have to decide whether to kill Yankees or uh, kill uh, uh, Southerners. Here as ever, here, here as always, war changed everything, uh, and war was making the atmosphere really steamy uh, in, uh, in Virginia, in, in Richmond. And making things even steamier was the meeting of a, a so-called spontaneous uh, convention of Virginians to rival the convention sitting uh, in this room. Uh, young hotheads, and they're always young, pouring in to Richmond from all areas of Virginia to hold their own spontaneous convention across the street uh, and to insist, 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 insist that uh, this convention get off its, ha get off its haunches uh, and, uh, and uh, secede, and to insist that if the, the uh, Southern Convention wouldn't now at last act, they were going to kidnap them and kidnap the governor and hang them all as high as they could. That's the kind of rhetoric that was steaming up in, uh, in, uh, in, in Richmond. The rhetoric was perhaps hottest among these old secessionists who had been so frustrated for two months listening to all this talk about how Virginia was going to remake the uh, Union. And they thought there was not a moment to lose. They thought Virginia had to secede immediately. And they thought that they had to act immediately to save uh, the federal installations in Virginia from capture uh, by Lincoln. Uh, they thought they needed to capture uh, Harper's Ferry Arsenal, uh, and they needed to capture the Ghostport Naval uh, Yards. And they wanted to act immediately, and they wanted to act before the Virginia Secession Convention uh, acted. And that made the Unionists in the convention absolutely furious. They said, this is a democracy. We haven't even voted yet on secession. We haven't even voted uh, to send the referendum to the Virginia people. The Virginia people haven't even voted yet to uh, whether they wish to secede. We're supposed to start a civil war now. We're supposed to start uh, shooting up uh, people now before these decisions have been made by the voters. This convention is turning into the most undemocratic of all conventions. We are going to decide Virginia's fate by the pistol instead of uh, by the uh, ballot box. So at this point, the two sides were really going at it hot and heavy. It is now April 16th. The issue is swirling about whether the convention Con members of the convention should physically seize Harper's Ferry Arsenal. The issue is swirling about whether we need to even wait for the convention to vote. The issue is swirling about whether we need to have the people endorse the convention. The issue is swirling about whether all this talk, 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 talk must now decisively end or uh, do we have to keep going? with these slow, democratic processes which are not allowing Virginia to uh, do anything. And that is the, the, uh, the moment that Mr. Brent Tarter has written his wonderful uh, skit about, and I want to uh, turn at this point uh, to that uh, skit, and I want you to forget that I am Bill Freeling, I'm no longer Bill Freeling, he just left the room, uh, and I have become uh, John Janey, the chairman of the Virginia Secessionist uh, Convention. I was uh, elected to this convention, thank God, as a unionist, 
uh, from uh, Loudoun County. Uh, and certain of my fellow, uh, fellow uh, Virginians wish to uh, talk to you about what should be done at this point. And I would thus like to introduce the three delegates who would like to discuss this with you. First of all, I'd like to introduce George with Randolph. George is uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson's youngest grandson. Uh, Mr. Randolph was elected to this convention as a secessionist. He was, uh, a, he was and is a Richmond lawyer, and though of course I don't know this, uh, he was about to become uh, a Secretary of War of the uh, Confederate uh, government. Mr. Randolph has taken his seat among us, and now I would like to introduce Mr. John J. Jackson of Parksburg on the Ohio River from Western Virginia's Woods County. Uh, <clears throat> Here he is, uh, uh, who is, uh, who is uh, trying to protect the most western part of uh, the state. He is a lawyer. He is a former general in the state militia, and thus you'll hear people referring to him as General Jackson. He ain't General Andrew Jackson, but he is uh, General Jackson, and he was elected to this convention as a unionist. And I'd also like to introduce to you George Blow. George Blow is a Norfolk attorney, a uh, board member at VMI, a Democrat, Stephen A. Douglas's host, uh, when Doug Douglas visited our fair state uh, in November of 1860 as a presidential uh, candidate. He was a member of the Virginia Republic's Congress. Well, he temporarily lived, excuse me, he was a member of the Texas Republic's Congress when he temporarily lived in Texas. And like Mr. Jackson, but unlike Mr. Randolph, uh, he was elected to the convention uh, as a unionist. Those being the players, I would like to introduce the gentleman from Richmond to take the floor, Mr. Randolph. <clears throat> Mr. President, I believe from all that I have read and can understand that we are at the beginning of the greatest war that has ever been waged upon this continent. That war will be fought with the entire force of the federal government and will unquestionably command the entire support of the northern people. Sir, I believe a warlike policy has been impressed upon the popular sentiment of the north. And from what I now read in the public press, I see no ground to hope that there will be, in the beginning, any serious division among them. I have just conferred with a gentleman who has come from the Northwest and with other gentlemen from New York, and they all told me that where they traveled, there was but one opinion, and that in favor of war. Now, sir, what is the object of that war? It is ostensibly defensive, merely to repossess certain forts and arsenals seized by the Confederate states and to collect the revenue. But can it be a defensive war? Can it be to repossess Fort Sumter and the other forts seized by the Confederacy? There is no chance of it. You may as well attempt to circumscribe a fire on a prairie as to attempt to confine a war to the neighborhood of the forts intended to be repossessed. We see by the President's own proclamation that 75,000 men are to be called into action. And as we have every reason to believe that up to one-third of that number will be concentrated upon the frontier of Virginia and at the city of Washington, it is my own opinion that unless this state now considers this purely as a military question, unless she now makes military preparations the first and primary importance, then we will be a subjugated people. There is no other alternative. You have got to fight. The only question is, which side will you fight with? 
as a military question, waiving all political considerations, looking solely to that which will enable us to maintain our liberties. It is my opinion that we must first relieve ourselves of any further constitutional obligations to that government and to call home from its service all our sons who are willing to abide by you. Fortunately, we have some gentlemen here who can answer this diatribe. Uh, and to do that, I would like to call upon my colleague, the gentleman from Wood County, General John J. Jackson. <coughs> Mr. President, there is no gentleman on this floor who appreciates this occasion with more solemn feelings than I do. Sir, I am choked. I can scarce give utterance to the estimate that I form of the matter we now deliberate upon. And in my humble judgments, the momentous consequences of it all. <clears throat> In times of revolution, to be patriotic is to shout for war. In times of revolution, it is to be a traitor to counsel for peace. Well, gentlemen, I fear I stand in that particular relation at this moment. <sighs> An old man. I am an old man, never out of Virginia with the exception of the, of the public service. I was educated at the military academy. I served for five years. What I recollect with bitterness my time after that service. I was attacked with a degree of violent hostility by abolitionists in the Ohio border. Hostility I think few men in this room could have withstood. Oh, damn. Uh, it was in that service that I had caused the arrest of several individuals along the Ohio who were subsequently brought here and punished in your criminal courts. It was that consequence, sir, that I became the object of unceasing attacks through the whole extent of abolition country. As a result of my service to the Commonwealth, my servants were taken from me. I suppose there's no gentleman within the sound of my voice who has suffered as much as I have in the cause of Virginia. I lost between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars worth of servants. And yet, there are gentlemen who would insinuate doubts about my integrity on the question of the Commonwealth's interests. But I can bear this. I can bear anything if I believe it comports with the good of my country. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. We will now hear from the gentleman from the city of Norfolk, Mr. George Blow. <clears throat> I feel, perhaps, as fully and as deeply as any gentleman in this body, a sense of the responsibility for the vote which I shall soon be called upon to cast. I came to this convention, sir, representing a union constituency. My purposes, as far as my humble abilities would go, was to continue and contribute to those purposes and uses as faithfully as I could. I knew what my constituents expected from me when they elected me. I believed, sir, that it was our duty during our long deliberations here to conserve as far as possible that union under which we have all prospered. But more, sir, I believed it was practical. I believed that if we but followed out the course that had been chalked out and marked by this convention, our efforts would have been ultimately crowned with success. I now believe, sir, that 
but for the interposition of that power that rests at the head of the executive branch of this government, our efforts would have been triumphantly successful. Now, sir, events have tread upon events in the last 30 days so as to make it impossible for any man to fix a marked course of duty. The last two days, the last 48 hours have, if they have not produced impressions upon the minds of others, have produced profound impressions upon my own mind. Sir, the hope of reconstructing this government is gone. The chance to reconstruct this union is but a myth. It exists now only in the mind of the visionary. Sir, the last act of this drama is now upon us. The curtain has been at last lifted, and we can see in all of its hideous deformity that long-concealed policy that has been by that party which I fear we have all misunderstood. Be that as it may, we are now face to face with revolution and with war. And I, for one, has ceased to look upon this as a political question or a question of reconstruction. We must look upon it now as a military question. It is in vain to try and disguise it. We cannot put that image away from us. We must look upon this as a military question and a military question only. Now that Mr. Blow has changed his mind, I fear that the cause of unionism is, is, is shaky, but nevertheless, I'll call on the gentleman from the city of Richmond once more, uh, Mr. Randolph. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I am a civilian, but we may all form opinions as to the general preparations necessary. In the first place, here is a dockyard in Norfolk, which it would be in our immediate interest to possess. I took occasion to walk through it last Thursday while I was there and to converse with the officer in command and to find out what they were doing. I ascertained that they were stored there up to 30,000 barrels of gunpowder in addition to several hundred guns of heavy caliber. If you seize that immense dockyard with all its ship timbers and vessels and streams, your armament is complete. You have got what you most need, an ample supply of powder, vessels and stocks and materials for a Navy force. But if you stand idly by, even now they are stripping it of everything and moving it off, those materials will be used to subjugate instead of to defend you. Sirs, the destiny of Virginia is committed now to our hands. We are sent here to advise the people don't let us distract the people by submitting to them alternate propositions. We are sent here to tell them what we think they ought to do, not to throw upon them the decision of a military or other question, which is in our purview to command here behind closed doors. Whether the state would benefit from cooperation or separate action, we are the people to decide. We know the grounds upon which to decide. We have the information, and they look to us for advice. And in my opinion, we would be wanting in our duty to them if we failed to indicate a line of policy which, in our judgment, they ought to pursue. This isn't going very well, General Jackson, but I call on you uh, to try to uh, stem the tide. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> <clears throat> I stand here an old man. I have loved my country, and I have served my country. Doubtlessly, I have not served it as well as I might have. And there are others, certainly, that have served it better. But I have served my country with my whole heart. Thirty-five years ago, I served on this floor. And though not a very old man in the public service of the Commonwealth, I stand here today having taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States 27 times. Was that an unmeaning ceremony? 
when I called upon the eternal God to witness my oath to support the Constitution of Virginia and the United States, was that all for nothing? <clears throat> Is it registered there for nothing? In a few years more, I expect to be confronted with him. My time has nearly ended. I am in the, the sear and yellow leaf. And the question is now <laughs> propounded to me. Excuse me, gentlemen. More than 20 times have I taken the oath to support the United States Constitution and am even now holding an office which requires obedience to that Constitution. The gentleman from Richmond astounded me beyond measure this morning when he intimated that it is not, it is, uh, that, 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 well, how did he say it? That this is a war to garrison the whole state. It is war, but it is not war to seize the public property within the limits of Virginia. Now, if that be the case, is it in the power of this convention to make an act of war which will change the relations of the people of the Commonwealth to the government of the United States? Have they not declared that you can do no act changing the relations of the Virginians to the general government without first submitting it to them? If you seize upon ships, if you seize upon the armory at Harper's Ferry, is that not an act of war? Doesn't it do just that? Doesn't it change the relation? I put it to the gentleman from Richmond and to this convention. If any of these acts is not a flagrant act of war against the general government, which necessarily changes the relations of them to the government. What signifies your act of secession? If you are to be guilty of an act of war, why go through the sham of sending the people an ordinance of secession when you yourselves have struck that bull at once by seizing upon ships, arsenals, and etc.? Why, sir, it is a solemn farce. <clears throat> solemn farce. The people of Virginia, if permitted to do so, they would have voted this convention down altogether. Mr. President, I have never believed that it was base at any time for a man to look before he leapt to consider before he undertook an act, to survey the whole subject and to see whether he was forcing the representatives of the people here who have rights upon this floor as well as others into measures which have not the approval of their judgments. To examine what this war is all about and to reflect upon every other difficulty which may grow out of this transaction. We are told that as for the protection of slave property, my people have none. They have rights and interests. And if their people, if these people could believe in their other, in, in their consciences, that your rights and interests in this particular were greatly depreciated, they would readily grant you all their support. But they cannot believe it. And if any could believe, be alive to the, the interests of this institution, I would have been that man. I have had a clear, painful light showered upon me. In consequence of those transactions I have already adverted to. I have not yet been informed that the government is at fault for the lack of protection that is complained of. Did the government of Virginia come to my relief and protect me and restore to me my property? They did not. The government of the United States and Virginia did all they could 
and having done so, I was bound to be content. A bad man may steal your horse or your Negro. Do you hold the government accountable for that? You have no more right to hold the government of the United States responsible for the theft of your Negroes than you have to hold it responsible for every man who chooses to steal your horse. Mr. Randolph? Sirs, if we have to fight, then let us fight on behalf of Southern rights and not to sustain the enemies of our section. In my humble judgment, the ordinance of secession, so far from being a war measure, is the most pacific course that could be adopted. The enemy is coming down upon us with his entire force. And here we stand. And in my opinion, no man ever yet escaped danger by turning his back upon it. Face it like a man. Call your sons to the field. Give them the best arms you have got. And put your trust in your cause and in the God of battles. Sirs, I do not mean to say that secession will save your liberties and existence, but if you do fail, then you leave a page in history which your descendants need not be ashamed. My own opinion is that a bold, manly, decided course will operate a moral influence on the North and bring them to a stand until mediation comes between. But if we give way, that storm will burst upon us and destroy us. General Jackson. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> it does strike me that the government of the United States is acting on the defensive. I may not be able to comprehend the entire bearing of the proposition, but according to the best lights of my understanding, it does seem that the United States government is acting on the defensive. Viewing matters in this light, can you expect me representing a people with family and connections on the other side of the Ohio River? Who are allied with the people of that state by intermarriages. Do you expect me to abandon them all and throw them away by giving sanction to this proceeding? You command our hearts. You command our hands and our all. But, sir, if you precipitate, if you precipitate this matter, you must not expect us to be led like beeves to the slaughter. I tell you that when grim-visaged war is staring us in the face, the old men of this country will, make up, will wake up and begin to revolve this thing around in their minds. And they will hold to a just accountability those who shall bring upon us this terrible disaster. This is the way I feel. I and my people like me. We cannot help believing that it is a great sacrifice in the interests of the state to take up such a step as seems now contemplated by this convention. Why follow in the footsteps of South Carolina? Have you yourselves not recorded your testimony that there was not sufficient cause for secession? Have you not stated that the mere election of a president is not enough to cause you to take this step? The agitation and excitement which has generally prevailed may get gentlemen to disregard their conscientious convictions and yield, and yield to the popular current. But the day is soon coming they will have to confront the great tribunal on this subject. I have sought to do my duty to man and my God. I love my country. I love my fellow man and I forgive all. It is because I do feel this way on this 
on this momentous occasion that I felt called upon <clears throat> that I felt called upon to bear witness against this precipitous action. Mr. Blau from the city of Norfolk. I feel impressed by the solemnity of this occasion. I feel impressed by the importance of the decision that this convention is about to make. And sir, so, I have made up my mind that although I represent a union constituency, at this moment, as a matter of prudence, as a military question, as a question involving the very existence of this commonwealth and for all our interest, my vote shall be that Virginia shall resume the power she has granted the general government. As I understand the question on both sides, they all urge to the same point. The slave states must stand up and shoulder to shoulder with their fellows for this coming contest. And I am forced to come to the conclusion that the most effective way of doing that is for Virginia to take a decided stand now and not wait for a discussion with the border states. <clears throat> now is the time for us to bring our supplies and men in solid column. Now is the time for the people to stand shoulder to shoulder ready to fight to oppress this this oppression. We cannot run away. That bridge has been brushed aside. We are compelled to resist. We are pledged to resist. Honor requires it. Self-interest and self-preservation require it. And after all these circumstances, are we to throw in questions about doubt? and difficult to be discussed and canvassed throughout the whole of Virginia for the next two months? I trust not, sir. And I hope it is the pleasure of this convention to pass the ordinance of secession. <clears throat> now I'm Mr. Freeling again, uh, and I should like to tell you that almost immediately after that speech, Henry Wise got up in front of this convention. Henry Wise pulled out a horse pistol, waved it at the delegates, announced that by his order, although he was only the ex-governor of Virginia, by his order, the Virginia militia was going to seize Harper's Ferry and, uh, and the Gosport uh, Naval Yards. Uh, and he said, if any man wishes to stop me from doing this, they can come up and try to assassinate me. And several minutes later, about uh, 150 years uh, and another uh, an hour and a half from now, the Virginia Convention voted 88 to 55 to, to recommend to the Virginia people that uh, secession take uh, place. The vote on May 23rd among the Virginia voters was more decisive than that, uh, 45, uh, <coughs> by a four to one majority. Uh, Virginians decided to uh, secede. But there was a very, very significant minority there. 55 delegates voted against secession, uh, and the Western Virginians decided that they could not abide this decision, which they said was by the gun, which they said had been forced on the convention by the military, by Mr. Wise's horse pistol and the whole proceedings had been undemocratic. And as a result, Western Virginia seceded from Virginia. And that was crucial. All of it was crucial. Back, uh, way back on uh, February 4th, uh, when only one third of the southern states had seceded, the big issue was, will the rest of the South secede? If none of the rest of the South had seceded, then uh, there is no way Jefferson Davis's army could have prevailed. If all of the states seceded, uh, then uh, Lincoln uh, was going to have a difficult uh, time. But uh, if they split, 
uh, and half the Upper South seceded and half the uh, Upper South did not secede, then there was going to be trouble. Then there was going to be a terrible civil war. Then it was going to take years uh, and 600,000 lives to find out who would win. And that is the importance of the Virginia Convention. We've learned much today and there's much more to learn. I would encourage you to visit the Library of Virginia for our exhibition, Union or Secession, Virginians Decide, and here at the Virginia State Capitol, the struggle to decide Virginia's secession crisis. You can also find out much more online at www.virginiamemory.com. Thank you very much for joining us. Support for A Commonwealth in Crisis, The Virginia Secession Debates, is provided by The Future of Richmond's Past, The Richard S. Reynolds Foundation, Clifton and Emily Woodrum, and by the members of the Library of Virginia Foundation.